Amen. Okay. So let's jump right on in into the word that we have for today, which to me has been a, a difficult one to grasp. Not because there isn't anything to say, but because there is everything to say about this. And so I just want to start off with this expression that I heard a couple of years ago. This week I Googled who actually said this, and apparently it was a lady named Gretchen Rubin who wrote this in a book called The Happiness Project. And I'm not endorsing it because I actually have no idea what this thing is about. I just happen to like this one sentence from it. So please don't buy it and quote me. And if it's horrible, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, but she says in this book, she says, the days are short, but the years are long. And I know every parent in the room can identify with that. I know that everyone on some level can identify with this phrase, that the days are long, but the years are short. Right? I read this, and I think about it as a dad. And I just like, I don't know how the like, greatest source of joy in my life also makes me question my existence when I put them down, when I help and put them down. I'm not even with them for that long in the day. I only have a couple of hours, and yet somehow, like, when I put them down to bed, Ann and I go and lie down in our bed for a few moments, and I contemplate praying for Jesus to take me in that moment. Be, like, I honestly sometimes do. I said, it would just be so much easier if I just lay here and never get up. But I love them. And I think about my kids, and I just, almost nothing, like, besides Christ and besides my wife, nothing brings me more joy in this whole life than my two kids. And somehow Ryan is five years old now, and Paige is over two. And I'm just like, I don't know where the, where the years have gone, but every day feels like it's forever. Right, I think the pandemic taught us that. Julie is watching my kids today, and she is exhausted. She's about to fall asleep, and she's been with them since 7 this morning. Thank you, Julie. Uh, but it's just it's so tough. And you just think about the journey I've had with those kids. Man, I like remember vividly watching Ryan be born. I feel like it was five seconds ago, not five years ago. But then every day feels like forever as well. It's crazy. I think about this as a husband, too. I met Anne on August 28th of 2005, and we've been together since then. I can tell you exactly where I was in the room when I saw her, and where I was sitting, and where she was sitting, and what we were doing, and some of the people there. Like, I remember it so vividly, 2005, all these years ago, this coming week on the 22nd, Anne and I will be married for 10 years. I can tell you, like, so much of our wedding day 10 years ago, and it's crazy, and it's felt, it feels like forever ago, and it also feels like it was just yesterday. It is just insane, the journey that we are on with the Lord, the journey that all of us are living through. Like, to me, it's just insane. We have these moments that were so long ago, and they feel like they're just happening right now. Like, I'm, uh, I can say this in a church as young as we are, and if I say this in most churches, I, like, lose a lot of credibility. But I'm 35. I'm one of the oldest people here in our church, which is insane and not normal. It's weird. But I'm one of the oldest people here. Like, I am closer to 40 than I am to 30. And I, that doesn't make me sad. I love growing up. I want to be old. But, man, like, that's crazy. That's also crazy at the same time. This has been a journey. It has been a crazy time. Like, the Lord has been so good to me. It's both felt like it's taken forever, and it also feels like it's all been so fast. You know, as a son and as a brother, man, the stories I could tell about my family that I don't have permission to, so I won't, are, have been crazy. My, immigra my immigrant story here in the U.S. is full of crazy stories that make no sense outside of an immigrant context, and Paul is getting hit, so I think he has some stories there, too, but it's just insane. 35 years worth of stories to tell. It's just insane what the Lord has been up to. And then I also think about this as a believer. Man, like, when I honestly first came to the Lord, when I was 18, I remember, the, I remember everything about that moment. I remember what he told me to do. I, was, I went to a Christian school, but I didn't, really, I didn't go because I wanted to be at a Christian school. 
But I was there, and the second day that I was there, the Lord, I was at this worship event because my roommate was there, and it was the second day of college, and I was afraid of being with anyone or by myself. And uh, I went, and I was there half-heartedly, and I, I knew that I heard him say in my heart that I had to go back into my room, and that night I had to decide, not that it would be the last time I got that invitation, but that that was a special moment. And so I went back to my room, and I, like, I knew my assignment was clear. That night, decide if you will follow me or not. And luckily, I did that night. And he started this process of changing everything, and then, like, no one is more surprised in this entire world that I am doing what I'm doing, that I stand in front of a single person and say anything about the Lord. No one is more surprised than me because I changed my major in college because of one public speaking class. Like, well, there was one public speaking class in my major, and I was like, no, I'm out. I'm not doing that. I'll change my whole future just to not take this class. Like, it, it's crazy, the journey that God has us on the things that he does and how he works, it's like really quite insane to me. And it's crazy that I've like been following him for all these years now, like with my whole heart. And sometimes I feel so different. And I know that's the truth. I am, I am a new creation before God. He has made me new. My high school friends will not tell you that I was the way I am today. Like, Anne, when I met her, would not tell you that I am the same person that I was when I met her, when I was a horrible boyfriend for the first couple of years of our relationship. It was rough. But yet, like, sometimes I feel like I am completely new, and sometimes I feel like I am still the same kid I have always been. And I want us to kind of live in that tension this morning of living in that tension of like, man, I'm this new creature before the Lord, and yet I like feel no different sometimes. Uh, a, one of the most famous Christian writers of all time, a couple centuries ago, his name is St. Thomas of Kempis. He wrote in his book, Imitation of Christ, he said, it's rare, it's a rare thing for a Christian ever to break a single bad habit. And I just like that. It is rare for a Christian to ever break a single bad habit. I think that lives in that tension pretty nicely. It's like everything is different. Everything is different. Everything about me is different now that I follow Christ, and yet also sometimes nothing is different. Sometimes I feel like the words that Paul wrote are ex like written only to me. I do the things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I should do. Right? That explains me perfectly sometimes in this life. But there's been a journey, and it's been a crazy journey that the Lord has overseen. And I want to live in this tension today. Because our Advent characteristic of the Lord today is that Christ is our sanctifier. Right? We are in Advent season, and if you're like me and didn't grow up celebrating Advent, Advent is the four weeks before Christmas where the global church prepares to receive Christmas, like the heart of Christmas, what Christmas really means, that our immaterial, infinite, uncaused, causing God put on humanity and came to live within his creation, right? That everything, that God himself put on all of our limitations and came here in such a low way and he lived this life that none of us could live. And he bought our freedom with his blood like no God ever does that. And so Christmas is in the tension, right? It's just another day, and yet it is not just another day. It is the day that we celebrate that everything about eternity changed forever. And Christmas is different and it's special. And so we do this prep work, not that we are running around building or doing all these things or changing all these things, no, but our prep work is giving God room to make Christmas mean something different in our hearts this year, for it to sink in deeper, for us to embrace what we're preaching today, that Christ is our sanctifier. And in this Advent season, we are going at it through some, we just, I want to get us some more CNMA, our denomination, more of our DNA, and that our whole denomination is built on four things, that Christ 
is Savior, that Christ is Sanctifier, that Christ is Healer, and that Christ is our coming King. And that is what encompasses all of the Christian life. And so today we're talking about the second one, Christ as our Sanctifier. This journey that we're on with Him where He is always at work and sometimes we feel it and know it and sometimes it feels like we are so far from it, but He's still at work. And so let me pray again for us really quick before we read God's word, and then we'll jump right on in. So Lord, again, thank you. I pray that you would be in the reading of your word, that you would make it come to life in our souls and our hearts for our eternity, for the present and for the future. Lord, everything is in your hand. And so we give you reign to speak to us today. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you could stand with us, the text is going to be on the screen. We're going to be reading from verse 18 to 31. And God's word says this. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers, Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Because of him you are in Christ, because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let no one boast, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Amen. Take a seat. And so there's At the same time, there's everything to say about Christ as our sanctifier. And I feel like, honestly, I feel like today I have like a 10-minute anointing. Like I have like a couple of minutes. And I feel like I've I've had like pages. This is actually the sermon, I think, all year that I've had the most amount of notes and the most amount of things to say. And I get here this morning and I like don't feel permission to say almost all of it. I just like want today to be painfully simple, painfully plain. I, like, I want to just stand up here today and talk about the journey that we are all on with the Lord when he is our sanctifier. When we are living this life every day and every year and in every aspect of our lives saying to the Lord, like, Lord, work in me, shape me, mold me, do the work that only you can do. This whole passage here starts, uh, 1 Corinthians starts, and if you're not familiar with the book of 1 Corinthians, the Corinthian church was one of the most problematic churches in the early churches. Like, it had all of these things going on with it. And Paul writes to them, and he starts off his letter saying to them, right, the first thing that he says in, in verse 10 to verse 17 is, like, there's no divisions among you. There was, like, they were fighting between doing the things that we do as people all the time. He's like, oh, no, I, I'm a part of Cephas, right? Cephas. I came to faith in Cephas, which was Peter. I came to faith in Apollos, which was another speaker we see pop up in Scripture. Or it's like, oh, no, I'm from Paul, right? And they were just fighting, and they were doing the things that we tend to do all the time. And he's like, there's no divisions in the church. You know why? It's actually like, to to summarize this, it's like, 
but because like you guys are all kind of pretty not that great. Right? Because kind of the whole point of all of this is that only the low find Christ. Only the ones who know that they're broken go to his table. Only the ones who have not been invited to all of the other parties answer the master when he calls to go to his party. Like one of the things that I love Formula One, and just to say, I love Formula One before it became popular on Netflix, right? My dad used to drag me out of my bed as a kid at like two in the morning, at three in the morning, five in the morning, and I would watch races with him, AKA most of the time I fell asleep, but still I can like say, oh, I've been watching Formula One my whole life. My dad would wake me up all the time and watch it. And if you ask me to this day, like Pedro, what is the most beautiful thing that humanity creates? I, to me, it's a Formula One car. It is just like so beautiful. It is so aesthetically pleasing. And the engineering behind all of it is quite insane. It's like really quite remarkable. I would say that a Formula One car is the most beautiful thing that humans create. But like in this passage, I like am reminded that we think so high of ourselves and we really create nothing. The best that humanity ever does is repurpose what it already is. Like do you, have you like ever really thought about that? We actually don't make anything. We just take what is and we change it. We put some stuff together and it becomes the combination of what was already there. There's only one thing that ever creates, and it's the Lord. Humanity, we, actually, we make nothing. We repurpose everything. And that's kind of like the heart of what is at the baseline of accepting Christ as our sanctifier. We really can't make anything. We can't even make anything of ourselves. Right? There's some of us in this world, in this city especially, who are like just so capable of doing amazing things and they're so successful and they are so just gonna accomplish amazing things. But like what do we really ever make of ourselves? At the end of the day, in hard seasons and in good seasons, we always come to this place where like, ah, I can't change myself. I can't really do anything that's too meaningful in my own heart, in my own life. Like Thomas of Akempis, we can't even really break habits. We can't really even get over a couple of really big things in our lives. Like, in one sense, Christ makes us new, and in, in every other sense, in and of ourselves, like, we remain the same. It's like, man, I am, like, sometimes the same scared boy that I was when I was eight years old. I'm 35, and I'm no different in some regards. Like, let's live in that, let's bring up that tension again, man. Like, I am totally new, and I also at times feel totally the same. I can't do anything in myself to improve any part of my character. I can change my behavior at times when I try really hard, but I know I'm not changing my own heart. And God, in this story, God brings in Paul's mind, and he's like balancing all of these different things about wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. He's like interplaying between wisdom and folly, and he's like, what is really wise and what is really folly? What is really foolish? What doesn't make sense? He's like, the Jews, in the spectrum of the ancient world, it's the Jews and the Greeks. The Jews, the like most literal of people, and the Greeks who are all about philosophy and wisdom and high thinking, right? And he says that the cross, that the Jews demand a sign and the Greeks demand wisdom but the cross is a stumbling block to both. Like sometimes I think we try so hard to make everything so relevant and we forget that God, like he puts stumbling blocks in front of all of us all the time so we could really let it sink in deeper. We preach Christ crucified. That's what we preach and it's foolish. Like sometimes honestly, I'm standing up here or I'm talking to somebody in private and, like, when I start talking about eternal life and, like, being resurrected, I'm, I have to pause a second and say, oh, my gosh, this sounds so crazy. This sounds really quite too good to be true. And like, it's a stumbling block. It's too big for us. It's too wonderful that a God would do all of these things. I feel so broken most of the time. 
I feel no different, and yet he has made me into a new being. He's the only one who produces any change in me. But the biblical conclusion from Christ our sanctifier is in, in verse 25. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Like God at his lowest is way better than anything I could ever do. Humanity, everything that we know, doesn't compare at all to the Lord. Here he asks us a couple questions like, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? He writes everything down and knows everything, knows all the laws, knows all the right answers. Like, where is that person who can answer these questions? Where is the debater of this age? And like, our answer is always, no one compares to you. And so the groundwork that we need to lay for Christ being our sanctifier is that like, I can't do any of this on my own. And then he gives us the answer. He leads us to it. In verse 30, he says, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification. Jesus is our sanctifier. He is the one who sanctifies us. And I'm, I'm running out of time. I thought today I would be really short, but I, some, when I think that, I always go longer. So let me get to the point here, because I feel like a little discombobulated. That Christ being our sanctifier is that Christ is the only one who can produce change in our being, in my heart and in my character and everything that is eternal that God made in me. I can't change, but Christ can do all of the difference. Uh, in the CMA, we talk about three tenses of salvation. There are three tenses that scripture lays out about salvation. One is when it all begins is that I have been saved, I've been justified. Like Christ's death on the cross has justified me before the Father. I can know him and have a relationship with him. The, the present tense is that I am being saved, and that's sanctification. That's the work that he's doing right now. That's what we're talking about right now. And just for references, I will be saved. It is a glorification that will come later when he makes us whole, when we see him face to face and he covers every single one of our cracks. But like, I just want to get this into our minds that like the work of sanctification is that if you have heard the, the word of the cross and if you have heard what Jesus has done and you accept that, you are saved. You are saved on the spot and that change is immediate. From that point on, you are a new creature, right? Ephesians says that we are sitting at the, in the heavenlies with the Lord right now. I don't know how that is true with how I feel broken all of the time, but it is true because he's also doing the present work of sanctifying our very souls our very beings, everything about who we are and where we're going. And I just want to offer us a working definition of what sanctification means. This is just like something, uh, hopefully, that is an everyday definition of sanctification. Sanctification is the Holy Spirit's ongoing work that picks up and moves a believer towards God's righteousness. The work is both immediate it's regenerative and ongoing, which is sanctifying. The work produces change in the character, which steadily produces change in lifestyle and perspective. Graciously, the work only requires submission and particip participation, partnership from the believer of being made new from the inside out. When somebody asks you about what Christ does when he is our sanctifier, it says you can tell them confidently that I have been saved when I heard about the cross and I accepted that sacrifice. I'm changed, I'm different, but I am also in the process of being changed all the time, of having him work in my character and produce real change in who I am and what I do and how I think. It is only requires participation, right? There's a lot more to say about that, but we don't have the time another time. There's a couple of heresies that we often fall into in here, but we will get to that later. It's kind of important. But sanctification is the Spirit's work, is Jesus' work of changing our whole character, making us more like Christ, making us genuinely possess the fruits of the Spirit. Patience, peace, kind, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and a few others that I don't remember off the top of my head. And so the worship team can come up here. 
we're going to worship this sanctifier a little bit. But I also wanted to give us, like, I feel so jumbled in my head right now. But I want to give us this. I want us to know if we are in a sanctifying relationship with the Lord. If we allow him to genuinely come into our being and change us from the inside out. I think it's really quite simple. I think that if we spend an honest moment and ask ourselves a couple of questions and invite the Holy Spirit to answer them for us, we can really understand if we allow Christ to be our sanctifier. That if you just sit in a room by yourself soon, this week, today, before Christmas, so you can prepare for his coming, and you just ask yourself, have I changed? Am I different from when I first came to believe? Like, is there really difference in my character and in my lifestyle and the way that I live? Has he produced something in me that I know was not a part of me before? If the answer to that is yes, then you know Christ as your sanctifier. Continue to participate in the work that he's doing through the spirit of making you look more like Christ. And if the answer to that is no, don't despair. Because that's the thing, if you ask him to do that, he will say yes every time. If you feel like if you look at yourself, ask the Lord to open up your heart and your life and the way you live and the way you think and what you do. And if you're like, no, like I have not changed, ask him. But also, if you're the type of person who's just really hard on yourself all the time and you can't show yourself grace, ask someone who knows you for a very long time. Ask someone who knows you before you were a believer, if you know somebody from then, or ask someone who's just been with you walking on this journey for a few years and say, hey, do you think I'm any different? And if the answer is yes, praise God, lean into what he's doing. Let him sanctify you and make you who he says you are. And if the answer again is no, just ask him and he'll do it. And so let's worship. And if in this moment of worship you feel like you can't sing, ask yourself these questions. Ask, am I, have I been changed? Am I a new creature? Even if you feel like me sometimes and you just also still feel like the same person you've always been, ask him and he'll tell you the truth. And so let's worship him and then I'll come back. So if you're the type of person who is always like, I've got to get better. I've got to work on myself. I've got to change this. I've got to be this version of a believer that I think I should be. Let me play a part in gently dismantling that to say that the only thing of good that will ever happen in your soul is what the Holy Spirit is doing. Is the Holy Spirit conforming you to the image of Christ? Is the Holy Spirit giving you his character and slowly over time working it out with you through the course of every day that you have whether it's decades or a few years or from here on out, if you have decades more or hopefully not, but a few hours, a few days, however long you have, it's the Holy Spirit's job for you to participate in, in the making of you to look more like Christ. The Advent promise in Christ being our sanctifier is that God knew that we couldn't do this work on our own. He knew that we would be lost. We were lost. And he came to be with us, our Emmanuel, which we sang about earlier, that he came to show us the way to live the life that none of us could, so that also we could get the spirit which would work with us every day of our lives to look more like him. You can't do it on your own. Actually, you can't do it at all. It's the Holy Spirit's job and his work. All you need to do is participate and say yes and go where he leads you. So that's the Advent promise for us today, is that God wasn't good on accepting from afar, I'll just save them when they die. No, every day is full of his guidance over us. And I also just wanted for us to continue to be in that tension. I wanted to read from us from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 and 14. It says this, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, 
I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so our call, like I just pray in this Advent season that we would just learn how to press on how to continue one foot in front of the other, allowing the Holy Spirit to do his work in his perfect timing. And so let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you again. You are our sanctifier. You are the only one who produces real change in our being, in our character, in our virtue, in our lifestyles, in our worldview, all of that. And so, Lord, I pray that more in this Advent season, we would be a collection of people that let you do the work that you've been doing all along, that you promise to continue to do in your saving of our souls. Lord, we love you. Teach us what it means. Help us to see where we have really changed. And then, Lord, help us to continue to let you change us. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.